let's proceed with our exploration of compressors. In part A, we delved into the fundamental layout of the compressor. Now in part B, our focus shifts to detailed design considerations. Our previous video provided an overview of the compressor layout as shown here. Within this compressor, the housing serves as a main body. It houses key components such as magnetic bearings and the motor. Today, our emphasis is on examining the shaft. Now, let's direct our attention to the shaft here. Shafts can be crafted from various materials including 1045 carbon steel, 4142 alloy steel, ductile, iron, and others. Selection of material largely depends on the engineering decisions. Also, it is important to specify the shaft balance specification in the drawing. You could find more details in part 24 video on rotor balancing. In certain cases, you may need to outline the minimum tensile and yield requirement in the drawing if needed. Also, as you could imagine, identifying natural frequencies are crucial. Part 14 video outlines the detailed steps to identify natural frequencies and will explore the typical equipment setup for the impact testing. After the impact is applied, the signals from the sensors travel to the data acquisition. The output from the impact test includes natural frequencies and their corresponding mode shapes. For more step-by-step -step procedure on impact testing, refer to part 14 video. With this information, predicting rotor motions becomes more accurate. Further insights on running a rotor dynamic model using this information can be found in part 6 and part 3 videos. Let's delve into how to define the tolerance at the shaft. To define tolerance, it is important to understand how the shaft interacts with surrounding components. First, identify components around the shaft, including those at the magnetic bearing location, and motor, and impeller, and so on. Specifically, areas where the sensors face the shaft are. Define with datum A and B with a tolerance range of plus minus 0.02 mm. Typically, the tolerance for the magnetic bearing location is more forgiving compared to the tight tolerance required for the ball bearing mounting location. This is because magnetic bearing operates with an air gap while the ball bearing needs a very tight fit control. For details on the ball bearing mounting fit, please consult part 12 video. Now, let's shift our focus to the backup ball bearing location. At the backup ball bearing location, the total runout can be defined as 0.03 mm, which is equal to 30 micrometer. The total runout here means the gauge measuring the shaft surface cannot vary by more than 30 micrometer over the entire reference feature. Let's return to the overall layout around the shaft. At the motor location, the total runout can also be defined. Again, revisiting the overall layout around the shaft here. Now, let's consider the impeller location. Concentricity can be used here to ensure good fit with the impeller. Because equal mass or inertia concerns are the one of the leading cause for the concentricity callout. But often using runout or position tolerances are more practical. In fact, in many occasions, runout or position tolerances usually replace the need for concentricity because they are easier to measure. The method for defining the tolerance typically varies based on the preference of the engineers involved. Once more, turning our attention to the overall layout around the shaft here. Here are defined shaft tolerances accompanied by material spec and the balance requirements that should be included in the drawing. Again, well-defined tolerances guarantee good fits and clearance with the adjacent parts. In the next video, we'll delve into further details about other components in the compressor. 
if you have any questions or if there is anything else you'd like to explore, feel free to leave comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next videos.